We'll be in Ephesians chapter 6 today, if you want to be opening up your Bibles there, that's where we'll be uh, spending our time. Uh, as we look at the letters of the Ephesians, uh, some things to be reminded of or mindful of. We've recently been looking, as was in the scripture reading there, sort of surveying the first part of chapter 5, uh, this idea that we're supposed to be imitators of God in his sacrificial walk of love, right? We saw this idea there that's expressed that God wants you to behave and act in a certain way. And then he says, don't be deceived, right? Don't be deceived. Don't be fooled. Don't be tricked by those who would say that God does not care how we walk, that what we do with our lives does not matter. Instead, Paul says, we need to be uh, walking as children of light. We need to be wise. We need to discern what God's will is concerning these things. Uh, and then we started looking at this idea last time then of submitting to one another, right? He's going to, Paul's going to spend the end of chapter five and the beginning of chapter six. I don't know why they split it. I'm not really sure. I still haven't figured out why they decided, you know, husbands and wives goes here and then we'll start a new chapter. It makes no sense to me. Uh, but he says that you should submit to one another and he's going to lay out these sort of three relationship pairs, right? Uh, and we started out looking last time at husbands and wives and how they ought to treat each other. But the idea here that we're looking at is sort of in context of, you know, what Paul wants us to understand, not just about how we behave. That's an important thing, though many of us has heard several lessons in our lives on how husbands ought to act and how wives ought to act and how children ought to act and all these things. Uh, but Paul's point here is that when we do that, we in some way imitate God, right? That we're walking as his children. So the question we want to be asking is, how is it when we act in a certain way that that shows or demonstrates the characteristics of God? Or we might say, what do we learn about God? Or what can the world learn about God or Jesus through the way we act in our relationships. And so last time we saw this idea um, that a wife's submission, right, to her husband is a picture of how the church relates to Jesus, right? And so wives, when you think about your relationship, people look at your relationship, how do people look at that and say, oh, that's how the church behaves, right, towards Jesus? Are you painting a good picture of that or are you showing something different, right? Uh, we saw secondarily husbands loving their wives is a picture of Jesus loving and nourishing the church as his own body, right? He looks at the church as his own body and he loves it and he nourishes it and he treats it because he wants its best, right? He wants it to be glorious. Uh, he wants it to be blameless. He wants it to be holy and sanctified. And so husbands, how you treat your wives is a picture to the world of how Jesus treats the church. And so when we think of it in those ways, we can understand why it is that God is very concerned when we don't act in these ways that it says what? That his wrath comes on the children of disobedience because you're basically showing the world God is like this when he's not like that. And so that would make him upset, right? Uh, and so as we look at this text and it moves forward, we're going to look at chapter 6 at these last two uh, relationship pairs we see today. And the title of our lesson today is In Heaven because you're going to see this overarching theme. I'll sort of uh, not bury the lead. You're going to see this overarching theme that uh, how these relationships act is a demonstration and a reminder of what's happening up in the heavenly places. And so uh, we'll see this theme come up several times. But let's start by reading verses 1 through 3 of chapter 6 of Ephesians. It says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise, so that it may be well with you and you may live long upon the earth. And so... As we look at these three relationship pairs, the next one is going to be children and parents, and then specifically in the next half, fathers and how they treat their children. Uh, and so we're told at first, children, what ought you to do? What are we supposed to do? And so the first step is, it says, children, you need to obey your parents. Pretty straightforward, easy statement, right? Children, obey your parents. Now, we saw last week this idea of this to what extent sort of question, right? Uh, how much should the uh, wives submit to their husband? How much should the husbands love their wives? And here we have a similar sort of statement. It says, children, you should obey your parents in the Lord. Right? And so there's this sort of caveat or qualifier there, children out there. Uh, children, if your parents ever tell you to do something that's in direct contradiction to what God says to do, God says you have the ability and the right and the, the obligation to disobey them then. Right? So, you know, if your parents, for example, said, Hey, I want you to go murder your sibling, right? You have you have to turn them down on that. I know some of you might be like, "Well, mom said I got to do it, so you know, 
But no, 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 God says, nope, nope, you only obey them in the Lord. Uh, and so that's the extent to which it goes. But there's this other statement that follows that, right? It's not just you have to obey them. Uh, kids, if that was it, really you should be lucky, right? Uh, I always thought that the obeying part was sort of a, a, a bummer when I was a kid. Uh, but actually it's the second part that's harder, right? He says you should obey them and what? And honor them. Right? And so that sort of tells us something beyond just the things that we do, right? It has to do with the way that we do it and the attitude that we display. That idea there of honoring father and mother, uh, which really is a quote. Did you notice that? Maybe your Bible doesn't have the quotations. That's a quote of the Ten Commandments, right? You can go back to Exodus 20 and verse 12, and it's, that's right there. It's in the list. Honor your father and your mother. Uh, and he says this is the first command or a statement with a promise. And when you go back and read there, and it's displayed in Ephesians as well, he's, he tells you what the promise is, right? In the Ten Commandments, he says, honor your father and mother. And he says, so that it will be well with you and you may live long in the land that God has given you. That's an interesting sort of idea because right up front, uh, in, in the giving of the law, God is saying, hey, people, you want to keep the land that I'm giving to you? You want to stay in the land of promise all this way you've come to get here? You want to stay there? He says, whose responsibility is it? It's the children's responsibility. Isn't that a weird thing? And he said, children, if you want to live long in the land, you guys want to keep this land, you've got to honor your parents. He puts it on the kids right out of the gate, which is an interesting sort of idea there. But that idea is that uh, this word of honor is to be weighed down by abundance. That's what the root of that idea there is. And so it's uh, children blessing and giving abundance and recognizing the abundance that your parents give to you. You honor them. You respect them. You give them these things. Why? Because it's for your own good, right? Parents aren't doing things just to be mean to you. They're not doing things and treating you in a way because they, they want bad for you, right? He says these things are for your own good. And so what does that teach us then about Jesus? What does that teach us, obeying your parents, about Jesus? Well, there's this interesting uh, verse in Hebrews chapter 5, verses 7 through 10. Uh, over there it says that uh, Jesus, even though he was a son and he prayed to God diligently, I'm paraphrasing slightly, he prayed to God diligently, uh, sort of about those things that Tom was pointing out a minute ago, right? That I don't want to suffer these things, right? It says, and he was heard, God heard him, and then it says, but what? But Jesus learned obedience through the things which he suffered. Right? And as a consequence of that, it says, and so God said to him, you are a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, and all men receive salvation in Jesus. And so this idea that's expressed there is when Jesus obeyed the Father, he was then exalted. And so children, when we obey and honor our parents, what it does is it demonstrates the proper relationship that Jesus as the Son uh, gave to the Father in heaven. He submitted his will, right? We saw that as well in that text. Not my will, right, but yours be done. And so children, when we are out there and the world looks at us, and now I can't control the children out in the world, right? But when the world looks at the church and sees the children in the church, children, ask yourself, if people look at you, are you displaying how Jesus reacted to the Father? If people look at you, they say, that's a good picture of how Jesus submitted to the Father and how he obeyed him in all things and he did all things. Or would they look at you and say, man, Jesus was kind of a rebellious kid. What's the picture that you're painting for the world? We're supposed to be demonstrating these things and imitating God, right? And so how is it that people would understand the proper relationship that they had, Jesus had toward the Father? And furthermore, it's supposed to be a picture of how we relate to God, right? Because we call God in every prayer, well, not every prayer, but I'd say a good 90% of the old generation at least, right? And I'm putting myself in that group. We start all of our prayers how? Our Father in heaven. And so are we demonstrating children what that relationship is supposed to look like? As we keep going for sake of time, verse 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. Fathers, you have a responsibility 
here as well. Now again, this is spoken in this way because fathers, it's your job, it's your responsibility. Now I know mothers play a big role in this also, but fathers, you have something you're told to do here. Your responsibility toward your children is to bring them up in the Lord's discipline and in his instruction or in his uh, admonition, some of them say. And so the idea there is uh, you train them and you teach them with a specific purpose, that's the idea of discipline, and you set their mind, that's the idea of admonition, through warnings and through teaching, you set their mind on a certain path. And that path that you're supposed to lay out, right, is sort of the extent phase. It's not really said to what extent. Now, there are some descriptions there. Uh, are you supposed to do it to your own good? Train them up in your discipline, in your instruction? Is that what you're supposed to do? No, you're supposed to train them up in the Lord's discipline and in his instruction or in his admonition. And there is a way that you're supposed to do it, it says, not provoking them to anger. Parents, sometimes it's really easy when we've had you know, a rough time with something, right? Maybe you had a rough day at work and your boss is on your case and things aren't going your way or you got cut off in traffic or who cares, whatever it was. And you come home and you feel a little powerless. So what's the easiest thing to do? Let me just demonstrate some power over the people I do have authority over here, right? Let me just take it out on the kids. And what it says is that's not the way we ought to act. We ought to take our own desire for vengeance and our own desire for ego and our own desire to say, I'm a somebody. And we ought to do what, right? What was verse 21 saying? We do submitting to each other. I subject my own will and say, instead of acting in that way, I'm going to demonstrate the nurture and the admission of the Lord here. And this idea is common in the Old Testament as well. You can go read several places in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy and the Psalms and the Proverbs. Uh, parents were specifically told, fathers, teach these things to your children, right? When you walk in the way and when you sit down and put them on the doorposts of your house, teach your children these things. And so this idea we're trying to grab here is what does this teach us then about God, our Father? What does this teach us about Jesus and his relationship to children? And the thought that first came to my mind was Matthew chapter 23. Jesus, when he's on the earth, he's there and he looks out at Jerusalem when he's coming in one time. And he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I wanted to gather you up as a mother hen does her chicks. But you were unwilling. How does God want to treat humanity? How does God want to treat children? God wants to demonstrate something of his character, right? And so, fathers, we might ask ourselves, how is my leadership mirroring what the Heavenly Father is like? Someone told me one time that one of the most damaging things, and again, this was a, a Christian gentleman, he told me one of the most damaging things that happens when fathers are abusive to their children, Right? When fathers abuse their children, he says one of the most damaging things is now you've set for your children, this is what fathers are like. And then they come into a church one day and everyone goes, oh, let me tell you about our father in heaven. And those people go, fathers? Pfft, I want nothing to do with fathers. Fathers are wrathful and vengeful and awful. And they just act out any way they want on their own whims. Right? That's what fathers are like. And so fathers, when you're raising up your children, are you showing them what God is like? Where your children think that God is a wrathful, vengeful, evil, dictator sort of father? Or will they think that your father is one who cares for you and loves you and wants to gather you in and wants to nourish you and wants to raise you up and bring you up? And when people look at the world outside at how you treat your children, do they say, that's a good example of what God is like? Or do they go, I want nothing to do with that God? How is it that we're doing raising up and bringing up our children as examples of what God our Father is like? Five through eight. It says, Slaves, obey your human masters with respect and reverence, with sincerity of heart, as you would the Christ, not just under your master's eye, as people pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing God's will from the soul. Serve with a positive attitude as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that whatever good each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether he is slave or free. The final relationship is of a slave and master. And we don't have this relationship specifically anymore, right? I don't own any slaves. I suspect none of you do as well because it's been you know, outlawed in this country. So if you do, you ought to fix that. But we don't have this slave and master relationship. But they did in that day. And we can take learning from this still as well. And so he starts out by saying, slaves, slaves, 
You need to do something. Slaves, you need to obey your masters, right? And in what way or to what extent? He says you need to do it with respect, with reverence, with sincerity, right? He says you need to do it to the extent that whether they're watching or whether they're not watching, you're still obeying the things that they would do. You're still treating them in a respectful way. In fact, he says you need to do it to the extent of as though that guy who's your owner, who's your master, is Jesus himself. He says that's how you ought to act. That's how you ought to behave in this way. And I think, you know, if I, if I try and understand what Jesus was like and what he was about, I think that this particular... Um, imagery. This particular idea of how slaves ought to obey uh, is one that's probably very close to the heart of Jesus. Because Jesus himself, when he was here, what does he say about himself? He says, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others. And so, you know, it's a very interesting thing that God does very often, uh, this sort of turning things upside down from how we might do it ourselves, right? Uh, God looks down and he says, you know what What's going to perfectly illustrate what I want and what Jesus is like? Instead of taking the king, I'm going to take the slave. Right? And so in the New Testament, there's this picture that's presented of servants, slaves. Those of you that are in this position, you have this unique opportunity to mirror what Christ was like. The Son of Man did not come to serve, but serve others. And there's this idea that's expressed there to slaves or servants of being the picture of Christ. He says, remember that whatever good a man does... Whatever good that one does, he will receive back from the Lord. All right, that's what Paul tells them. So I want you to think about Jesus for a minute. It says Jesus came and he served and he did the will of the Father and he uh, served to, to great cost. Right? He didn't want to do it. He served to great cost, it says. And what was his result? What was the result for Jesus? He received exaltation. And Paul says here, right, whatever good a man does, he will receive back from the Lord. Jesus served all, and he was exalted by the Father. And so when we're in this position of service, I don't think any of you are directly slaves, but if we're in the position of service and under someone else's authority who's telling us what to do and how to act and where to go and what we do in our time during the day, right? Most of us have employers at least. When we're in that position, how does our service towards others show the world about how Jesus came to serve? How does our service towards our boss uh, demonstrate to the world how we ought to serve others outside of that relationship? It's really hard for me to go and say, yeah, I'm all about serving. I'm really about serving other people. And then people come and observe me at my work and they're like, that guy's a total slacker and getting away with whatever he can. How is he telling me, oh, I'm all about service? Well, not to this fool, right? That's a different thing. That's not what Jesus did. That's not what Jesus wants to picture. Jesus took on the towel and got down on his knees and washed people's dirty feet. And so he says, we serve our masters as though we're serving the Lord himself. And then finally, as we near the end of our time that we've got, he says in verse 9, and masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Stop using threats, knowing that the master of them and of you too is in heaven and there is no favoritism or partiality with him. Finally, he turns to masters. He says, masters, uh, and this is a really big thing, right? We oftentimes think, how are we supposed to treat our slaves? What did Paul tell him? He said, I'll just treat them good. Is that what he said? Well, the first thing he says is, treat them in the same way. In the same way as what? As, as the slaves are supposed to treat you. Now, if you want to see something that's quite counterculture, Right? Or you want to see something where uh, God says something that's totally the opposite of what man says. Right? God says, masters, serve your slaves. That's what he tells them right there. Because right? he just told them, slaves, you've got to act in a certain way. You've got to uh, think about what they would do. You have to think about their good. You have to treat them with reverence and with respect. And Paul now comes along and says, masters, treat your slaves that same way. Remember, we started with what? Submit to one another. And so he's saying, masters, you've got to submit yourself to your slaves. You've got to treat them with a positive attitude. You've got to treat them in a way that is not about gaining your own desires and about serving the self, but it's about concern for them and what they're like and what their life is like and what their situation is. You have to treat them in a positive way. And in fact, he straight up tells them, in case you're confused, 
yes, I'm telling you, stop abusing them and mistreating them. Stop doing that. Don't act with that sort of behavior. Now, the first question I want to answer before we get to my soapbox is he says, what does this tell us then about God? What do we understand about God through the master side of the master-slave relationship? What he wants us to understand is that our master in heaven is not harsh. He is not threatening. He is not abusing. That is not what God is like. Sometimes I think, you know, if I'm being honest, and I think about my younger life, and I think about what really, you know, made me decide I want to follow Christ. In my younger life, what I probably thought is, I don't want to go to hell. Right? And I have this picture of God as, God is up there, and he's abusing, and he's threatening you. Get in line, or you go to hell. Right? That's the picture of the threatening God. Do it or else. And we have that picture sometime of what God is like, but what God is trying to get us to understand through the master side of this relationship is that's not what he's like. How do I know that's not what he's like? Because what did Jesus say when he was on the earth in regards to this master-slave relationship? He said, all of you who are burdened and heavy laden, right, come to me. Make me your new master. Make me your new master. Come and learn of me because what? Take my yoke, because it's easy and it's light. And you'll find rest for your souls. Jesus wants us to understand that I'm not trying to drive you into my arms. I'm telling you I've got something better for you. And he has this interesting statement there Paul does at the end, which I think is really pretty powerful for those that are on the upper side of this equation. right? And sometimes I have to make sure I put myself on that side as well. He says something very important. He says, recognize and realize that you have a master up in heaven. You might think, I'm pretty much the top dog down here on earth, and all these people serve me. And what he says is, you should realize and recognize that you've got a master up in heaven. And he looks down on you, and how does he see you versus how he sees your slave or your servant? He says he sees you exactly the same says there's no partiality there. Our master will not look down on us and treat us differently because of our socioeconomic status. Right? And in fact, we might say if he has any sort of way he treats one group differently than the other, he puts a heavier burden on the ones who have, right? Because he expects that we do something with that. And so if you think that, listen, I'm an American. And I'm well off. And I have things so good, and my life is so plush, and my life is so awesome. And you know, I go places, and people defer to me, and people respect me, and I have a good name. And you know, maybe if you're really up there, and I fly on private jets, and I meet with the president, and I do whatever, or I am in power, or any of these sorts of things, surely God is going to treat me the same way. So I'm somebody important. What he says is, there's no partiality or favoritism with God. God's not going to look at you and treat you better. And so how do we apply this to us? There's no masters in that same sense of the Ephesians that they had there, but how do we apply that? And I might ask myself, what does how I treat those that the world sees as less? How do I treat those on the other side of what we might call the socioeconomic coin? How does how I treat those people tell the world about how God treats us. When I only treat people that are of my same class or above really good, and I take it out on my workers, right, or I take it out on those who I think are a little lower than me on the socioeconomic ladder, what does that tell the world about how God treats us? Do they look at that and say, well, it's important how far up you climb? That God cares about those who have. Or when I treat those people who are beneath me, if you're online and only listening, those were air quotes. When I treat those who I feel might be beneath me well, how does that demonstrate what God does and his concern for those who are less? Friends, we live in a country and in a world and a society especially that says, listen, the way you get ahead is you cut costs in your business. That means 
paying people as little as you can, treating them as poorly as possible, extracting as much profits as you can possibly take. That's what our country is built on, friends. That's the American way. And God says, don't be like that. That was the Roman way. I told them back then, stop doing that. We haven't learned our lesson at all. Because God says, that's not how we get ahead in the world. That's not how we get ahead in the eyes of God. There is no favoritism with him. So if you have employees, or you're a little bit higher up the ladder, remember, God's watching. And he puts on you a heavy burden like he puts on slaves a heavy opportunity. How you treat them tells the world about how God is going to treat us. We're out of time for today. We'll start looking next time at... uh, you know, one of our favorite passages perhaps there in the end of chapter 6 of putting on the armor of God and those things. I know you've all been waiting to get there uh, to that, but let's go to God in prayer today. Our God and our Father in heaven, we come to you thanking you for uh, this time we've had to open up this letter to the Ephesians that Paul wrote, that you uh, inspired him, and that you preserved down through the ages for us. Uh, Father, as we come to you at this time, we're thinking and considering and mindful of those relationships we have as parents and children uh, and as slaves and masters uh, in the modern sense. Uh, Fathers, we we pray that you would help us in whatever position of those relationships we find ourselves, that we would do our best to uh, learn of you and learn of your son through that relationship and that we would do our best to emulate and to imitate that relationship in a way that's pleasing to you so that we can show others in the world around us your character, your nature, and the nature of your son. Uh, Father, we pray that uh, those who are children here would honor and obey their parents. We pray that those who are parents and fathers, especially here, that we would raise up and nurture our children in your admonition uh, and not be provoking uh, them to wrath or anger so they would reject you. Father, we pray that those of us who might be slaves or servants here, uh, that we would do so in a way that is pleasing to you and that mirrors the service that your son demonstrated while he was here on the earth. Uh, We pray that we would give our best effort Uh, to serve as though we are serving your son. And Father, those of us that may be masters or higher up here, we pray that you would help us to realize and recognize that it's our uh, responsibility to serve those who serve us, uh, that we're not better off uh, just because the world has seen us in a better place, but instead uh, recognize that you are a master in heaven and and help us to understand that how we treat those uh, who are servants, slaves, employees, that we would... uh, be called into account for that, Father, and we recognize that uh, you treat us all the same, uh, that, that our money and our wealth is no, uh, no guarantee or power before you. Father, we're grateful that you have looked down from the heavens, that you see us, uh, that you recognize us as your children. We pray that you would um, raise us up and that you would exalt us uh, as we seek to serve you. We pray all these things in the name of your Son, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Uh, we're going to sing the song that Alex has.